So um, we'll have that up, and then uh, of course I've got uh, the scriptures now on my uh, uh, phone live stream. I'm kind of watching this so I can see who all is commenting. Um, I'll make sure that I uh, am able to say hello to, to whomever. So um, we'll have that up, and then uh, of course I've got. Uh, the scriptures and stuff up here on the side. So if you are here, go ahead and leave a comment um, so I have a record of, of who all is uh, dropping by to say hello. But um, we're going to just do one chapter today since we're getting back into this. Uh, gotta remember, there's a delay on my phone for this. All right, so we're in uh, Exodus 32. Hope you guys can hear me. Uh, it's been about a week, but I did some uh, tech, chest that tech checking before we got... Uh, started so it should should be working just fine um, we're going to be reading out of the king james i have the esv up for some uh, modern english considerations uh, although i uh, i don't i didn't see anything when i was going through this to prep uh, where there was like some absolute confusion type things here um, also have the uh, original language up i did go through it and check this on this one uh, on a couple of times where it says the lord in uh, capital, uh, capital letters, there's one time where Aaron says the word Lord and he's referring to Moses, but all the other times are actually um, the not translation of the word Yahweh or Jehovah. So I uh, just wanted to confirm that because there is a little bit of confusion here with uh, the golden calf. But uh, anyway, uh, glad you guys are on board with this and uh, this one shouldn't take too long. Uh, it might be a fairly short one. Uh, it's a very familiar story. Um, but uh, there'll be a couple of points to make as we go along. So let's get started. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For us, for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has what has become of him. So remember, Moses goes up into the mountain and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights and so towards the end of this time period not not like the last day but towards the end of it we're kind of getting a little bit of a, a flashback here of what's going on down in the camp while Moses is still up on the mountain and so the people see that Moses is taking a very long time to come down they get impatient uh, their faith is waning um, and so they uh, they kind of bring Aaron before them and they say Make us gods. Now remember, <clears throat> when we look back at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham was uh, had very strong faith in God. Isaac had that same kind of faith. Jacob, it took him a, a, a bit, but eventually he came around. Um, and then, of course, we had when uh, he took Le uh, Leah and Rachel out of Laban's uh, camp or out of his where he was, uh, Rachel brought the fake gods with her we don't know why we aren't told anything more about them only that she brought them don't know if that was for her herself personally or uh if that was just to you know maybe send a sign to laban or whatever um but there there was a little bit of doubt that comes jacob was a, a doubting person uh for a lot of his life when we see that he wrestled with god and, and god really had to work on him um and then remember from jacob to this generation, we're talking about Israel has the 12 sons, and then there's only like three generations to Moses, because uh, Levi has a son, and then has a son, and then Moses. And, and so uh, with, with just a very short amount of time, with, within just a few generations, um, these people are in Egypt. They're surrounded by the Egyptian culture. They're surrounded by the Egyptian religion. And so, um, you know, there, there's a little bit of removal there from Jehovah. Of course, the, Joseph is there, uh, and the brothers are there. Um, brothers, not so great people, but they kind of mature and grow up or whatever. But they know who Jehovah is. Um, and then when, when that generation dies out, another Pharaoh comes into power. And uh, that's where the the Hebrew are switched over to slaves and so they're 
they're not really thinking about high and mighty things. They're thinking about when is their next meal. They're thinking about uh, food, shelter, those kinds of things. And so it's very easy for them to become corrupted because nobody is there really, you know, reminding them of Jehovah, reminding them of the goodness, of the promise, of, of all the things that Jehovah had promised to Abraham. And so they they get inundated with this Egyptian culture and Egyptian religion, and so it's in their mindset that they have, uh, or that they turn to these fake gods. Remember, these are gods that people built. They came up with and they built them, making them lesser than the people who worship them, which in my mind is very silly to do. Um, but this is, this is part of where this idea of the golden calf comes from. Uh, also remember there were people in, in Egypt, that the, the Egyptians themselves, that came out with the Hebrew people uh, and became kind of part of that nation. So uh, they're also bringing their own culture and their religion with them. And so, uh, you know, you can imagine them being part of what's stirring up all that trouble. So uh, they, you know, a little over a month has gone by and they're immediately turning back to this idea of worshiping a golden calf. I don't understand the need for this. I don't understand why the Israelites even bother with this. Um, I guess it's just so ingrained in the people of that time to, to worship something um, that they couldn't just, you know, like, well, Moses, take a long time. Let's go hunting or let's, let's build some houses or, you know, do anything other than, hey, let's waste some of our valuable stuff and build this pointless thing that we're going to now worship, even though we're the ones that built it. I don't understand that at all. I don't understand this choice at all. Uh, I don't relate to this at all. Uh, really and truly, but this is what they do. And so they say, you know, we don't know what happened to Moses. You know, what, we don't know what's become of him. Uh, you know, build us some gods so that we can worship them. Now, here's where it gets even worse. Aaron, remember, is one of two men. Aaron and her are the, the men who are Moses' uh, advisors. They stand next to him on his right and on his left. And, uh, they're the ones that are, are Aaron is especially has been like the spokesperson for Moses, has been there through all of this, right there on the front lines against the Egyptians and against uh, their their gods and you know, speaking of the plagues and seeing all of these things that are going on right there next to Moses. And what does Aaron do? Weakness. He's Moses' older brother, and what does he do? He gives in to what the people say. And Aaron said unto them, verse 2, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And, and they said, These be the, thy gods of Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So, some interesting things going on in here. Number one, Aaron gives in to them, tells them, you know, all of those golden earrings that you brought up out of Egypt. So those golden earrings indicate to me, uh, along with some other things here, that this is probably looking at the Egyptian group, the, these people that are largely Egyptian that came out with them, uh, not as much in, in terms of the Israelite people, but they're trying to corrupt the, the Israelites, is what I'm, I'm seeing here. Um, now, that doesn't mean that all of them were Egyptians. Uh, some of them we can see are related to the Israelites. We'll, we'll see this a little bit later in the text, but I see a large Egyptian influence here. Uh, and the golden earrings are one of those indicators for me. Okay, um, and he received them at their hand and fashioned. So what is Aaron doing? Aaron takes the, the golden earrings and he fashions this golden calf, this molten calf, with a graving tool. It's very important to understand that the Bible tells us what he did, and then later on when Aaron tells Moses, it's a different story. Okay, And then they said, who is the they? The they is referring to the people who were clamoring to, to Aaron to make this golden calf, this god. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel. Notice there's a separation here between the, the speakers. These be 
thy gods, they said, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. It's not, uh, and they said, these be our gods, O Israel, which brought us up out of the land of Egypt. So that also indicates to me that, they're, that, that the speakers or the ringleaders here are probably more likely Egyptian uh, in the nature than they be uh, the actual true Hebrews, the former slaves. Um, so the, the lesson, again, for the Israelite nation is uh, how much the, the other nations can corrupt them and, and corrupt them very rapidly. You know, here they've been sitting, they've been talking to Moses, everything's been going good. Moses goes up into the mountain, he's gone for a little bit over a month, and boom, and suddenly they're corrupted again. Okay? Um, so, <clears throat> verse 5, Aaron kind of sort of tries to course correct. Um, so, and when Aaron saw it, uh, he, he sees what they're saying, what they're doing. He built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast unto Jehovah. So they wanted that day to worship the golden calf, but he builds an altar, and he says, All right, we all, we all worship the calf today, but tomorrow we're going to have a feast to Jehovah. And he's trying to, to compromise is what he's really trying to do here. And it's very, uh, a very powerful lesson because... God does not allow compromise. Does not allow compromise with the religions of the world. He does not allow compromise with um, the the teachings and the practices of men. God says, "Do it according to the pattern that I showed you in the mount. Do it my way." Why? Because I'm your creator. I know the best way for things to happen. Do it my way, and you can't go wrong. Well, here Aaron is trying to, to kind of have the best of both worlds. He's like, all right, you got your calf, but I'm going to build an altar to Jehovah. Well, tomorrow we'll worship him. Today you can worship the calf. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So the people were like, sure, why not? And, and they, they offer their offerings and then they throw a big party. And so there's the golden calf over here. And there's the altar to Jehovah over here. And they're just, they're just having a big, a big festival out of the whole thing because now they have something that they can see to worship and when you have something to see it's less about faith um, the idea of faith we see in Hebrews 11 it's, it's the, the evidence of things not seen that's where our faith comes in we don't look at God we don't talk directly to God uh, in a sense where he's sitting right next to us in a chair you know there's a, there's a, an element of, of trust that he exists there's an element of trust that, that God uh, does the things that he does and says the things that he says without us having that direct evidence. Does that mean we have no evidence for God whatsoever? No, not at all. In fact, I wouldn't believe in God if there wasn't any evidence. Um, I'm a very evidence-oriented person, uh, scientist by trade. And so uh, for me, I've got to have the evidence, but I think the evidence is overwhelming that God exists. But I don't have any direct, I've seen God face-to-face -face kind of evidence um, and so that's where that faith comes in. So we have to we have to trust the indirect, uh, trust the Bible, for instance, trust the idea of creation itself. Uh, those are the kinds of things that, that we put our, our faith in and understand that God made the world, had to have made the world, and those kind of things. But they don't they don't have that. They they have a, a golden calf before it, so they're all happy. They get to see their their fake God and they get to worship, and so they don't throw a big party. All right, verse seven. And Jehovah said unto Moses. Go get you down, for your people, which you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed therein too. So here's the interesting thing. Aaron said, here, I've built this altar, and we're going to have a feast, and we're going to make sacrifice unto Jehovah. But what does God say? They've made a molten calf, and they've worshipped it, and they have sacrificed to it. So he doesn't accept that the altar is even built to him. He says, you can't have both the golden calf and worship to me, that doesn't work. So if you're gonna have the golden calf and an altar that you think you've built to me, that altar is actually just to the fake God. And so <clears throat> all of their sacrifices, everything that they said was to Jehovah God so that they could have both Jehovah and the molten calf, all of it ended up being just to the fake God uh, because God does not accept uh, equality with anything else because there is there is no other person or thing or any any concept whatsoever that is equal to God in any way 
And so he says, you know, that they, they've sacrificed to this fake God. And they've said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Well, what arrogance, what mockery. Who brought them out of the land of Egypt? That was, that was Jehovah God that did that. Every bit of everything that happened, the fiery pillar, the cloud, the crossing of the Red Sea, the ten plagues, everything was the power of God bringing them up out of the land of Egypt. And here they said, oh, no, no, that wasn't Jehovah. That was this calf that we just made yesterday that did that. It's it's like, I don't know, a, a kind of insanity um, to worship something that you make yourself to uh, to just absolutely reject the reality of what you've had to go through for the past few months and say, you know, it wasn't Jehovah God that we can't see, the God of Moses. It was this golden calf that we built yesterday. How does that even make any sense? That doesn't make any sense to me. Verse 9, And Jehovah said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. And I think when, when Jehovah is saying, I have seen this people, he's really saying, I've seen this people throughout time. I know what they're going to be like. I know everything that they're going to do. And they are stubborn people. Not just now, but always. I think that's what he's telling them. So he says, Now, therefore, leave me alone, that my, racks, my, my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Alright, let's see. Cameron, Holly, Shannon, Rose... Dean, welcome aboard, guys. Sorry I didn't have into the text and I didn't even look at my phone, so welcome aboard, glad you guys are here. Um, so, uh, Jehovah tells Moses, you know what? Forget that. I'm I'm not even going to go forward with these people. I'm going to start over with you. I'm going to just destroy them, completely and totally consume them, and I will make you a great nation. And Moses, he's pleads to God. He said, in verse 11, Moses besought Jehovah his God, uh, that's Yahweh Elohim, uh, besought the Lord his God and said, Jehovah, why do you, does your wrath wax hot against your people, which you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? So Moses is recognizing who really brought them up out of Egypt. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. So, the Moses says a few things here, and it's it's important because we're reading the King James. It's important to kind of dissect this and make sure we understand exactly what's going on. Moses says, "Look, you brought them out of Egypt with a lot of power, with a lot of demonstration. If you destroy them out here, then the Egyptians and by extension all the other nations are going to say." You know why did why did their God bring them out into the wilderness, into the mountains? He said, did He just bring them there to slay them, to kill them? You know, to completely do, eradicate them off the face of the earth? Well, what kind of God is that? And then Moses says, turn from your from your wrath and repent. Can God repent? Of course, God can repent. What does it mean to repent? Uh, anytime you repent of anything, it means that you are headed in a certain direction, that you have the intent to to go this way, to do this thing but you repent, you turn away from that and go in a different direction. So God doesn't sin. He doesn't repent of sin. But if God states, this is what I'm going to do, then Moses speaks to him, pleads to him, and says, please turn from this. Don't do this. Remember your love for your people and, and bring them where you said you were going to bring them. Okay? So, hey Derek, welcome aboard. And so, God is capable of doing this. And one of the interesting things about noting that God can repent, that God can change his mind, is that even though God is omniscient, and God has foreknowledge of all things, that uh, prayer, number one, is capable of changing God's mind. If God is going to do a thing, if you pray, uh, then God will do a different thing. Alright, we are going to try this again. Um, of course, with the storm hitting, everybody had to come inside. 
CCK behind me playing uh, Dragon Quest Builders 2. Excellent game uh, for both uh, young and old. Karis is here next to me playing Minecraft. You can see she just got out of the pool as the storm was coming in. So she needs to have her hair brushed, so I guess I'm going to be doing that here shortly. In fact, if you go get the brush, I'll brush it here real quick. No. Okay, well, enjoy your Minecraft. So, takes after her mom, what can I say? Um, <coughs> we are in Exodus chapter 32, and we will start in verse 12, uh, picking up where we left off last night. When I get to YouTube, these videos will be spliced together so that uh, it's just one continuous video. I don't think I'm going to do too much in the way of editing. Um, I just don't see a point in that. I'm going to try to pull up my... Uh, let's see if I can do this, if it's going to let me do this. Alright. Are we on here? Well, I know I'm live. It's just not showing up on my feed yet. That's weird. Well, there's from yesterday. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. Technical difficulties? Give me just a moment. I don't know. This is something I may splice out here. We'll see where this goes. There it is. Alright. Cool. Uh oh. Alright, cool. So we already got three people on. Hey, Kathy, welcome aboard. Uh, Alright, so uh, we're in Exodus 32, verse 12, and um, the Israelites have uh, required Aaron to make a golden calf. Um, and uh, Aaron fashions it, and he, he collects this money and fashions it or whatever, and then he says, uh, when Moses comes down and gets mad and, and breaks the, sta the tablets, uh, he says, uh, well, I just put the gold in the fire and this calf just kind of sprang out. You know, uh, obviously we're not going to believe any of that. Moses certainly isn't going to believe it. Um, but anyway, it angered God because this is, this is one of the very first uh, commandments that he gives them is don't have any other gods before me don't fashion any graven images and what do they do they've they built this golden calf uh it's a graven image it's a god uh that they're uh saying did all the things that god did you know this is this is your god that brought you out of egypt and all of that and so uh god is gonna kill everybody all of the israelites just wipe them out and start over with moses <clears throat> and Moses, you know, asked God to repent of this. It's not that God can sin, um, as we've already discussed, uh, but God does have the capacity to repent, to change his mind. That's what repentance means. So you're going in a direction, you change from that direction, going the opposite direction towards a different uh, opposite goal of that. And um, not only can God repent, but the other point I was going to bring up, hey, Carla, welcome aboard. The other point that I was going to bring up uh, before the lightning knocked out the internet yesterday was the idea that this also um, ends any thought of predestination. Um, if God can change his mind about a thing, if, if your prayers are actually capable of changing God's mind, then what does that say about predestination? Um, if, if you are... Um, now, I'm not saying that you just pray to be saved. The, the sinner's prayer is not found anywhere in Scripture. In fact, we know that God does not hear sinners in the sense of uh, listening for the purposes of fulfilling. We, we read about that uh, uh, in the New Testament. In fact, I'll, I'll look that verse up now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, it's in John. And, yeah, John 9, 31, now we know that God hears not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, he doeth his will, him he hears. So, um, you know, God doesn't hear sinners' prayers, but, you know, if you are a Christian and you have been immersed into Christ, that's one of the blessings that we have in Christ is the ability to approach God through our mediator, uh, which is Jesus Christ, and to pray to God for things. And it is the case that uh, God will answer those prayers. And when God answers those prayers in a way that, that changes what the outcome would have been if you had not prayed, then you have something of, of uh, uh, the idea of, of 
God repenting or changing from a path. That doesn't mean that God does wickedness or evil uh, in that sense, but it does say that God can change his mind. And how that works with God's omniscience, um, even I don't fully understand that, uh, but I know that God's foreknowledge is not the same thing as God for determining. Uh, the only person that I know of in all of history, uh, certainly all through scripture, that was ever predetermined for anything was Jesus himself. From, from before the foundation of the world, it was predetermined that Jesus would die. Does God know everything? Is God omniscient? Yes. Does God know the points where he's going to change his mind? Yes, again. Um, God does know everything of that I am firmly convinced how that works when interacting with the temporal realm when we look at the universe and we see things in linear fashion and you know a certain thing is going to happen we pray to god god changes his mind about how that's going to happen and answers the prayer i can't answer that question but it is very firmly uh, stated in scripture that prayer is effective um, that we can plead before god um, we can even plead in such a way as like a child uh, bothering the, the parents by pleading over and over and over and over again. We read the, the story of the unrighteous judge where um, God has uh, laid out this, this idea that there, that there was a, a plaintiff that went to a judge over and over and over again and finally the judge relented and gave in to the plaintiff and, and allowed them to have their way. And then it says, how much more is a benevolent God going to want to answer our prayers and to, to do things for us? So, um, Hey, Tracy, welcome back. Alan, welcome. Um, so the idea that God can change his mind, um, that God can uh, turn away from what he was going to do, and the very idea of the predestination, that the idea that God is biased towards someone or that God is uh, in some way um, prejudiced or, uh, as the King James says, a respecter of persons, is not found anywhere in the scriptures at all. Um, and so just, just the idea of God being able to repent is a good thing, um, because it means that everybody has the opportunity. If, if we are lost in our sins, then, then we have the opportunity to obey God's will and change God's mind. Because if we are lost, then God is going to destroy us. And if that never changes, then we, God will destroy us. But if we obey the gospel and we do the things that God has shown us in the mount, as it were, then following that pattern, God changes his mind and uh, adopts us as his children. And we even see in Acts chapter 8, there was the, the uh, account of Simon the sorcerer, who was uh, lost, was converted, um, and saw that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, the miraculous abilities were passed on to other people and he didn't want just the miracles he wanted the ability to pass on the miracles to other people because that would give him authority that would give him greater standing than those who just had the ability to do miracles and so there was a there was selfishness in his desire and peter rebukes him and says you have no law or part in this matter and you need to repent and pray to god that he will forgive you of this sin and so a Christian who, who sins, who, who has turned away from the light, turned from walking in the light, according to 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, if you turn and walk in darkness, you've repented from the light. You've turned and you've, you've gone away from God. And at that point, God, you know, nothing can take us forcefully, forcefully from God's hand, Romans chapter 8. Um, but we can walk out. Uh, and we can reject everything that God has given us and we can, we can turn to walk in darkness again. If we do that, then it is required for us to turn again. And uh, when we do, when we turn back to God, it says in James 5, 19 and 20 that, that it, to, to convert a sinner back to God, if any of us Christians do sin, let him know that he that converts a sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death. That's, that's changing God's mind by converting somebody back to Christ. And it, there's, I mean, all of this is absolutely destructive to Calvinism. Um, but just the very idea that God can change his mind, that God can repent, uh, is, is destructive to that idea. Does that mean we fully understand it? No. Can we fully understand it? I believe everything that God has revealed in his word can be understood, and I continue to study it. 
but I, I can't argue that I fully understand how uh, our free will and God's lack of predetermination of individuals and his omniscience all go together perfectly. Um, I haven't figured that one out yet, but uh, that's where faith comes in. And I trust that those things uh, are harmonious and compatible um, and just it's going to require more study, may require a lifetime of study, and I may have to wait until eternity to find out. But, um, you know, it's it's pretty much right there in black and white. So let's get back to it. Verse 13, uh, Moses continues talking to God. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swear by your own self. Um, we talked about swearing another time uh, in an earlier lesson that God can swear because God can see the future and God can be 100% certain that the outcome that he's swearing to uphold is going to come to, to be. We don't have that capacity. And so, uh, especially in the New Testament, we shouldn't be swearing. But Moses reminds him, you swore by yourself because there isn't anything higher um, that you said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and all this land that I've spoken of, talking about the land of Palestine, uh, I will give unto your seed and they shall inherit it forever. And again, there's that word forever. The idea is that, that for the for the entire duration of the time of God's promise, not for all of time uh, that the universe is here, the forever has has not meant that in any of the contexts that we've read yet. So, hey, Stephen, welcome aboard. Glad you're here. So, um, <coughs> anyway, uh, Moses reminds God of this promise, and, and so verse 14, and Jehovah repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And this is another point I wanted to, to bring up, is this word evil here in the King James, if you look at the ESV, it's disaster, uh, we're thinking calamity, we're thinking destruction. When, when we look at that word evil, it doesn't necessarily mean sin or wickedness in the traditional sense. Evil can also, in, in, in the King James, generally mean calamity or destruction or disaster. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. A lot of people will come here for a proof text saying, hey, look, God did. God was going to do something evil, so he's not God. And they just they don't take the time to dig deeper and try to actually understand what's being said. That's not what the word means. That's not what the context is talking about. He's talking about destroying his people. So verse 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both of their sides, and on one side and on the other were they written. See here, Stephen says, let's finish around and TDS with the wife. Yes, two adults in their 40s playing TDS. That's a thing in our home. I don't know what TDS is. I'm sure I would if you said it, but... Um, I'm glad you're here, though. The, um, the two tablets that Moses has, remember, he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He's not just getting 10 commandments. God didn't just write 10 little commandments. Uh, which would take God about that much time to write, certainly not 40 days and 40 nights. Um, these two pieces of stone are covered on the front, on the back, on the sides. Every square inch of these stones are covered. And the reason is, is because they carried more than just those Ten Commandments. They carried everything that God was giving Moses in terms of the law for his people. Okay, he's up there, and we, we only got a gist of that recorded for us in the past few chapters that we've been going over. We got the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and the priestly vestments and, and the altar and, and those things. We, we kind of got the, the big things, if you will, and we got those, those Ten Commandments and everything. But there's so many commands that God gives, and it takes the rest of Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all of that to cover all of the things that God had commanded Moses to do. And so... When he comes down and he has these two tablets of stone, everything is there. And then he sees what's happened, and uh, he's, he's carrying this, and it says, verse 16, The tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tablets. And then verse 17, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. And Moses says, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, in other words, victory. Neither is it a voice of them that cry for being overcome. It's not cries of, we're losing the war. It's a noise of singing that I hear. Moses says, they're not down there fighting. It's a party. 
And so it comes, it, uh, verse 19, it came to pass as soon as he came near into the camp and he saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mountain. Now here's the thing. <laughs> He's up in the mountain. God, who sees everything already, tells Moses what's going on. And Moses is like, God, please calm down. Don't destroy him. I don't want you to start over with me. Just chill out. And God chills out. Moses gets down there and he sees what God has already seen. And he breaks the tablets and he gets really mad and does exactly the same thing. So I thought it was pretty funny um, just seeing that thing. So uh, let's see here. A uh, recent random atheist referring to the evil in Isaiah so lame. Yeah, it, yeah, it's such an 80s objection. You're right. Like, come on, man, this is 40 years from there. Do you think that objection has been handled? Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Right, 100%. All the law was on the tablets, not just... And, and there's a lot of people that I talk to. There's a lot of people today, and, and Stephen, you deal with, with one faction of these, but there's a lot of other people that uh, I've talked to that are really big into um, going back and trying to follow the Old Testament. Um, they, don't, they, they say we don't have to do the sacrifices because of Jesus, but they're really big into following the Sabbath day uh, in particular and some other things. What's your name? I don't even talk. Not by yourself. Not by yourself. We've had this conversation. Sorry. Okay, they can stay over here, or you can. Okay, cool. You can play with them online here. Hey, Dean, welcome aboard. Um, so, uh, awesome. Hope you enjoy it. Go ahead. So, um, anyway, Moses sees all of this, and he, he breaks these, these tablets with all of these laws on it. He's, he's very upset, and um, verse 20 says, He took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strewed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink it. Um, and Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto you that you uh, have brought so great a sin upon them? So Moses turns to his brother. Remember, Aaron is his right-hand man. He's got Aaron and her on either side of him, helping him kind of lead the people and everything. And uh, Aaron is his older brother. And he, he turns to Aaron. He's like, what do they do to you that you would participate in this, that you would bring such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord, talking about Moses, wax hot, you know the people that they are set on mischief. So Aaron turns it back onto the people. You know they did it. It's their fault. They're they're a, a mischievous lot. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Okay. So Aaron is like, This is what they said to me. And I said unto them, Whosoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. What? <laughs> okay, we know that that's not how it happened. We know earlier in the chapter that Aaron got gathered up all the, the gold, and he forged it, he fashioned it, it says in the King James, that he made this thing with his own hands. Here he's telling Moses, well, you know the people, they're kind of mischievous, and... I just took their gold and I, I tossed it in the fire and man, this golden calf just popped right out. <laughs> yes, Stephen, exactly my thoughts on that. Big old face palm. So, um, uh, yeah, the, the Hebrew Israelites. And, you know, good luck with the, the sacrificing and all that. Um, so... <laughs> Aaron is definitely trying to, to backpedal and, and get out of this and to, to try to make his, like, I'm trying to distance myself from any kind of guilt here, um, but it's not going to happen too well. Uh, and then it says, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Um, the idea here is um, that the, the Aaron had let them go had let them get into this uh, abandonment, uh, this wild partying. Um, if you look at uh, Matthew 24, 
if you look at the parallels in the New Testament where it talks about uh, the days of Noah, it says that uh, the people of that time said, eat, drink, and be merry, uh, for tomorrow we, we die, or, or uh, those kinds of things where where people are just living how they want to. Well, this is this is where it is. They, they're no longer under Moses. Moses has been gone forever. They don't know what happened to him. God is not communicating directly to them. And so you have, and I believe it was a lot having to do with the Egyptian instigators. And I think I talk talked about that last time. Um, <clears throat> that the golden hoops kind of indicate to me um, a little bit that it was the Egyptians. And I think here we're about to see that the, the limiting of the destruction of the people uh, really kind of puts it on these Egyptian instigators that the it wasn't just the Israelites that came out of Egypt. There were a lot of people that came out that weren't technically Israelites that kind of got folded into that. And I think God does a lot of purging of them from the Israelites uh, because they are they cause so much trouble. Um, so anyway, Moses sees that the people are naked and that they're just they're involved in all of this debauchery down here. And uh, he stands in the gate of the camp and says, Who is on Jehovah's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together. So, right, yeah, Matthew 24, 38. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and so he says, who's, who's on Jehovah's side? And so all everybody that was uh, of the tribe of Levi jumps over to him. And they, they stand beside him. And remember, these guys are the priesthood and they're the support staff for the priesthood. They're the, they're the, the tribe that doesn't get their own land, that they're supported by all the other tribes. And so he said unto them, Thus saith Jehovah God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And so what they were told to do is every gate that, that every they're divided up by tribe you go to each tribe here and you find the people who were instigating all of this and you kill them so the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men now understand this we have said that coming out of Egypt is about 600,000 people it's a huge mass of people so a lot of times when we see uh uh, hold on here, I'm getting kid stuff here, just real quick. Um, so anyway, uh, when when the 600,000 come out, uh, part of those are not Israelites. And so when we see that only 3,000 people die because of what's going on here, there are some inferences that we have to make. You know, number one, are these people, uh, you know, it, are we talking about only 3,000 people were involved in all this? Well, no, Aaron doesn't die. Aaron was involved. He's the one that forged the calf, but he doesn't die. Um, what we're talking about here are really the instigators, the ones who, who came and kind of pushed for this. And it was a number of people scattered throughout all of the tribes. Um, and so... Uh, what we're really looking at here, I think, is a purging of some of those Egyptians that had that had come along with them, and were stirring up problems. So uh, that's my conclusion. Um, that's not definitive. Um, that's just me drawing some conclusions from little details here and there that I'm reading. So, hey, Tom, Jesse, welcome aboard. Uh, we're in Exodus 32, and we are getting pretty close to finishing up here. So. Uh, so verse 28, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people about that day 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves. To consecrate yourself uh, is to cleanse, to set yourself apart, to um, uh, go through uh, some kind of a, a process where you are made holy. And so what they're doing is, is they're, they're calling out or they're getting rid of the part that had uh, drawn them into this sin. And so that's that's what the consecration is about. Consecrate yourselves today to Jehovah, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. So you get rid of everything that is corrupting around you. And that's what the Levites did, is they went in and they got rid of all of the, the corrupting influence. They consecrated the Israelites that day. They, they made them holy. They, they separated them out 
from the corrupting influence by killing all of the people who were, were part of this instigation. So verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto Jehovah. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. So Moses is going to go talk to God again and try to make an atonement. Remember, he's already argued with God, saying, please, please, please don't destroy them all and start over with me. Um, and so he's going to try to see what he can do that the Israelites can can kind of move past this. So Moses returned unto Jehovah and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. So he's, he's back up in the mountain, is what I read here. Uh, oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin. So he's like, all right, they, they did what you told them not to do, but please, if you will, forgive their sin. But then he says, and if not, blot me out, I pray you, out of your book which you have written. So what is what is this book that God has written? Well, this is the book of life. We, we read about this book um, from time to time, especially in the book of Revelation, and it's a very interesting concept that has its anchor here in Exodus 32, this, this idea of a book of life that if your name is written in it, that your name can be blotted out of it. Now, what does that say for the idea of once saved, always saved? What does that idea have in, in terms of the eternal security and uh, another one of these Calvinist doctrines? <clears throat> if you are written in the book of life and God can blot your name out of it, he can remove you from it, then that means that there isn't any such thing as once saved always saved you have to continue to live your life faithful to god does that mean you have to live sin free no that's not what that means at all we look again at first john chapter 1 verse 7 if we walk in the light as he is in the light then his blood continually cleanses us from every sin how do we remain pure we remain walking in the light we're headed in the right direction we're, we're our eyes are set upon god are we gonna stumble on our way yes that's why it's called stumbling when we when we make a mistake and we slip and we fall we're still headed in the right direction the blood of christ continually cleanses us we're still pure it's when we turn to walk in darkness a willful abandonment that we become lost again and that's where james 5 19 and 20 says is if you convert a christian who's turned away from god if you convert them and you you bring them back to christ then you've saved their soul from death. So this idea here of blotting out of the, of the book. So, hey, Bonnie, welcome aboard. Uh, the idea that, that the Bible teaches once saved, always saved is not found anywhere. And over and over again, we're going to find, as we move through both the Old and the New Testament, that there are places where it is explicitly taught where we... Yes? where we uh, find that uh, a person who has sinned uh, can so sin as to lose their salvation, can not lose it so much as to throw it away, throw it back in God's face. So, uh, but Moses is saying, God, if you're not going to forgive them, then take me out too. I don't want any part of it. Um, I, it. It is not in me for you to start over with me. And so that's that's Moses kind of making a deal with God, not in a... Uh, in a way where he's kind of holding something over God, but he's just saying, look, I, I can't do it. If you if you wipe them out and you want to start over, please don't start over with me. And I think this goes back to Moses and, and his own personal weakness, the idea of you know him up on Mount Sinai with uh, the, the or was not not the not Mount Sinai, but the mountain with the burning bush where he's saying, I'm not I'm not a good speaker. And so God says, Okay, take your brother and let him talk for you. I think that's what we're dealing with here. So verse 33, And Jehovah said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. In other words, God says, This is the way that it is. I blot out those who have turned against me. You haven't turned against me. I'm not blotting you out. <clears throat> so verse 34, mm, got my team. And so God, God doesn't take the deal, essentially. And so he tells Moses, verse 34, Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto you. Take them to the promised land. Behold, my angel, my messenger, my malach, shall go before you. Who is this? Again, this is Jesus pre-incarnate. This is before he was Jesus the man. This is God the Son 
the ultimate archangel, the the supreme messenger from God was was God the Son. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Um, we see here, and, and I'll, I'll just finish up with 35 and I'll talk about it. And Jehovah plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So they didn't, they didn't get out of any punishment. Um, there were 3,000 that I, I believe were the instigators that were kind of, were the ringleaders of all this. They were wiped out. But the whole people for participating had to endure these plagues that God sent. And I want to I wanna talk a moment before I close here about this idea of, of God visiting or God coming. There are many, many times where God talks about, I will come or I will visit or I will, uh, I will be there. And, and when he says this, most of the time, it's not a good thing. Sometimes it is. Sometimes when we talk about God coming, he's coming to dwell in the tabernacle. He's coming to dwell in the temple. He is um, uh, coming to dwell among his people. And that's a good thing. But a lot of the times when God talks about coming here in Isaiah 19 and um, in Revelation, Matthew, uh, the Olivet Discourse, Mark, Luke, those times, all those times where God talks about coming, uh, coming in clouds of power, uh, all of that. When God says he's coming, it's usually to bring judgment against a nation, usually the Israelites or the Jews that have done wickedly. And here is, is the, the very beginning of that where God says, I will visit and when I do, I'm going to visit their sin upon them, and he plagues them. So this is the coming of God, and I want to establish this now, because when we start talking about Jesus is going to come again, and, and get into all of it and all that in the New Testament, and we start talking about God coming and Jesus coming and all of that, a lot of people want to say, well, that's talking about the end of the world. That's talking about the end of the universe. It's talking about the end of time, and most of the time it's not. Most of the time, when we read about God coming, it's about coming in judgment against a nation, particularly a nation, uh, particularly the nation of Israelites and the Jews, because that's that's most of what the Old Testament is about, and the New Testament is about the establishment of the church and the ending of Judaism, and so it's very important to understand that from the context of the scriptures as they are given, not on some Catholic myth or on some kind of a, a, a belief that was drummed up by some man somewhere we don't we don't let people even me here talking don't take my word for it it's not about me okay i don't claim any kind of special miraculous knowledge from the holy spirit um i don't have what uh, a lot of people talk about as as a, a miraculous or a personal indwelling of the holy spirit all I have is what I've read and studied from scriptures. Romans 10, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Uh, or, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so the idea is, is, is that we are supposed to study. And I'm studying. I hope you're studying on your own. The Bereans were called noble because they didn't just take Paul. And Paul did have the Holy Spirit in, in that miraculous sense. But they still took what Paul was saying and they went and they studied these scriptures, these very scriptures that we're studying right now together to see if what Paul was saying was true. And I hope you will do the same thing. Don't, don't look at me as any kind of authority because I'm not. I hope that I can just be a, something of a guide to point you to the scriptures and hopefully help you get back into the scriptures and study them and draw your conclusions from them. Um, but... Anyway, that's that's Exodus 32, the story of the golden calf. It's a familiar story, but uh, it's uh, it's probably something that you haven't looked at that deep before. Uh, if you have, that's awesome. If you haven't, hopefully uh, I've been able to point out a couple of things that maybe you can go study and, and uh, get some, some deeper understanding of those points from. Um, I do appreciate your patience, especially with all the, the internet problems and whatever today and, and yesterday with the storm and whatnot. Might be another one tomorrow. We'll see. I do plan on being back again at 4.30 tomorrow uh, to get into Exodus 33, maybe even 34. We'll have to see. But uh, I do appreciate you being here. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you are uh, 
certainly able uh, to leave a comment. You can message me if you want to if you want to talk privately. Uh, we can do that. Uh, I don't even mind uh, doing phone calls if you want. Um, send me a message, and, and uh, we can either talk over Facebook or we can uh, uh, talk over the phone. However, you want to do it. I don't mind talking uh, about Bible at any time. So. Uh, if you did get something out of this and you think other people would benefit, share it. Um, you can uh, subscribe to me on YouTube, Swordmaster Publications on YouTube. Um, I'll have these videos up uh, spliced whenever I get to it. Uh, I make no uh, no uh, statements of time or anything like that. So, where are you at? There you are. So, anyway, uh, thanks again for joining us, and uh, we will see you guys next time. Say bye-bye, Karis. Bye. -bye, <laughs> Can I watch for